Well, good morning. Um, I'm, I'm going to be uh, talking for the next 40 minutes about fossil fuel supply issues, and I'm going to be framing this in a little different way probably than you have uh, ever seen before. Um, and it, it, it may be controversial. It may be a different way. It may, may take a, a, a little effort to, to shift how you've thought about fossil fuels, but let's give it a try, see what happens. First of all, we need to understand the historic context. Uh, we live in an extraordinary time. The last 200 years have seen economic expansion on a scale completely unprecedented in all of human history. The last couple of hundred years have also seen rapid population growth. None of this could have happened without fossil fuels. Uh, energy is what makes things happen. We usually think the economy runs on money, and of course, there's, there's some truth to that. But in fact, it's energy that gets things done. Take energy away from the economy, and it, the economy goes away. Uh, we've been using energy ever since we've been human, but mostly in the forms of renewable sources like firewood, agricultural crops, and exerting energy into our environment in order to get things done by way of muscle power. Okay? That changed a couple of hundred years ago when we discovered fossil fuels, highly concentrated sources of energy that were made by nature over the course of tens of millions of years with no effort required on our part whatsoever, except at the very end of that process, we dig them up out of the ground and burn them. Maybe you've had the experience of running out of gas in your car and having to push your car 10 feet off to the side of the road. That's a lot of work. Imagine pushing your car 20 or 30 miles. How much work would that be? Well, you can do the math. It's something like six, eight weeks at least of hard labor to push a car 20 or 30 miles. Okay, we get that done for us with a single gallon of gasoline for which we're paying in, in California, where I come from, less than $4 and complaining. Okay, imagine that. Six to eight weeks of hard labor for $4. Can't get labor that cheap anywhere, and that's why we've mechanized every process of production and transport we possibly could. But fossil fuels are finite, and this turns out to be pretty crucial. Uh, because the oil industry is changing. I'm going to be talking mostly about oil, a little bit about natural gas and, and coal, but oil is really the linchpin, economically speaking. Why so? Because it's almost all of our transport fuels. And transportation, in turn, is absolutely critical to trade. So w when you think about it, from an economic standpoint, oil is really at the center of everything. But again, the oil industry is changing. That's what it looked like back in the 1930s. This is what it looks like today in many cases, where drilling a single exploratory well in ultra deep water can cost hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe half a billion dollars, and, and still come up dry. World crude oil production has more or less flatlined since 2005. Now, it's not because demand has gone away. Well, actually, demand in the U.S. is down, but why? Because oil prices are so high. Oil prices have gone from $20 a barrel to $50 a barrel to the international price now is hovering just a little over $100 a barrel now for the last couple of years. That's an extraordinary price. That would seem to provide every incentive imaginable for the industry to to bring as much product to market as it possibly could. And yet, again, as we see, it, it's not so much happening. Well, oil prices are very much connected to the economy. Uh, this, this chart shows the vertical gray bars are historic recessions in, in recent decades. And then the squiggly red line, of course, is oil prices. Every time we have an oil price spike, we have a recession immediately following. Now, we have had recessions 
that weren't caused by oil price spikes, but we haven't had an oil price spike that wasn't followed by a recession. Uh, of course, the, the biggest price spike we've, we've ever seen was in July 2008, and what happened in September 2008? The economy came apart at the seams. Of course, there were other things going on. We had a housing bubble, but where did the housing bubble start bursting? In those suburban communities where people had moved because they could afford the, the properties there. But then they had to commute long distances to work. So filling up the tank of the SUV started costing more and more. As oil prices went up, something had to give, and it turned out to be the mortgage payments. So we're at a situation today where the oil industry needs prices in the range of $100 a barrel in order to justify going out and looking for new sources of supply, whether those sources are in ultra-deep water or tight oil deposits in North Dakota or uh, tar sands in Alberta. All of these are expensive sources. If the world oil price were to sink back down to historic levels of uh, inflation adjusted, let's say $35 a barrel, those new sources would go away. They just wouldn't be economic to produce. But meanwhile, we know what high oil prices do to an economy. They drag the economy down, and that's one of the main reasons it's so hard for the U.S. economy to recover back to the levels of growth that everyone would, would like to see again. <clears throat> again, the problem is not that we're, we're not drilling enough. In fact, rates of drilling have skyrocketed, especially in the U.S. in recent years. Now, that has nudged up production. And this is the story that we're being told. We're being told that new technology is releasing a torrent of new production of oil and natural gas in North America. And this is changing the game. We can look forward to 100 years of cheap natural gas. The US is about to become self-sufficient in oil and may even be an oil exporter in decades ahead. I want to bring some reality to this discussion. Uh, the, the increased production, again, is coming about because of high oil prices and because of extraordinary rates of drilling. So if prices go down, if we let up on the accelerator of drilling, then what's going to happen? Now, this is a, a diagram that, that's familiar to most uh, geologists. It's called the resource pyramid. And it really explains a lot. Uh, and it would be great if more Americans were, were familiar with this basic concept. You can encapsulate this, this concept really just in an in a, uh, old-fashioned metaphor, the low-hanging fruit. Ever heard that? Well, th it applies overwhelmingly to fossil fuels. Naturally, we go after the low-hanging fruit first. Now, in the, with the resource pyramid, the low-hanging fruit are at the top of the pyramid. The most concentrated resources, the ones that are easiest to get, that, that cost the least to extract, that give us the biggest bang for the buck in terms of energy investment and also in terms of financial investment. That's the stuff that we've gone after first, and that's the stuff that's mostly gone. So we're, as we dig further down into the resource pyramid, the fossil fuels that we get cost more to extract, both in financial terms and in energy terms. We have to invest more energy to get that energy. There's actually a cutoff line at some point down this the levels of this pyramid, where it costs us as much energy to extract a ton of coal or a thousand cubic feet of natural gas or a, a barrel of oil. It costs as much energy to extract that stuff as we'll get when we burn it. And all the stuff that's below that line, it exists, it's in the ground, we can count it as resources, but we can't count it as reserves because we'll never go after that stuff. 
yeah, we might be able technologically to get it out of the ground, but from an economic and energy standpoint, it just won't make any sense. And in fact, most of the resource is in that category. So lay people often are bombarded with these enormous resource numbers with regard to, for example, um, oil shale in Colorado and, and Wyoming and Utah. This is stuff that's actually, geologists call it kerogen. It's, it's potential oil that never got cooked enough by geological processes. Well, we can extract that and we can cook it, but that takes energy. It takes so much energy, in fact, that it's pretty much pointless. Geologists have known about this stuff for decades and nobody has found a commercial way, a commercially viable way of turning that into fuel.